Welcome, welcome, everybody. Happy Thursday. Uh, we will take a, another minute or so and get started as we let folks enter into the uh, room. Okay, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Hello, thank you for joining us today and welcome to our webinar on how utilities are using federal dollars to accelerate the pace of lead service line replacement in Great Lakes communities. This event is hosted by the Blue Green Alliance and the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative. I'm Jasmine Mossbarger, the Communications Manager at BGA, alongside my colleague, Margaret Kornick. Together, we will help coordinate communications for this webinar in the background. Today, you will hear from drinking water utility leaders about improvements being made to the region's water infrastructure. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the Blue Green Alliance YouTube channel for later viewing. We will also send an email after the webinar with all presentations and resources that we share today. Each of our panelists today will speak, speak for approximately 10 minutes, followed by a Q&A session that will be moderated. Audience microphones are muted to limit distractions to the panelists and other viewers. Questions can be submitted using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will be collecting questions throughout the webinar, so feel free to submit them as you think of them. Now, I'll turn it over to Richard Diaz to kick off the show. Thank you so much, Jasmine, and welcome everyone again. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning to lift up National Lead Poisoning Prevention Week and the fight for clean water. As everyone on this call knows, there's no safe level of lead in your blood. And countless studies show that the poorer you are and the darker your skin, the more you are at risk of being impacted. Luckily, we are fortunate enough to have a leadership in Washington listening to the needs of communities. And through the Biden-Harris $15 billion investment in lead service line replacement within the bipartisan infrastructure law, we have a much needed resource to remove lead pipes. However, the scope of work is large. Getting the funding from the states can be challenging and there will be an incredible effort to ramp up both public and private workforces to get the job done. Today, we have three utility leaders with us who can shed some light on critical aspects of this work. And we welcome the expertise of our virtual audience brought together through complementary networks of BGA environmental and labor coalition partners. Now I'd like to introduce my co-host for today, uh, Mr. Travis Wheeler of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative. Travis. Thank you, Richard. Really appreciate uh, the introduction and thank you everyone for joining us on this uh, event today. Really excited for the discussion. So before we get started, I just wanted to uh, tell everybody a little bit about the Cities Initiative and our work on uh, water equity Perfect, Jasmine, if you could share those slides, I'd greatly appreciate it. All right, uh, you can go to the next one. All right, so the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative was founded in 2003, and we are a multinational coalition of local elected leaders, all working collaboratively to promote the environmental and socioeconomic health of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River Basin. We now have uh, approximately 260 communities of all sizes that are a part of this uh, mission. And we are also working now with uh, First Nations and tribal communities um, among our local elected leaders in addition to our traditional uh, mission of working together with mayors. Next slide. We work on a variety of challenges in the Great Lakes climate change and coastal resilience, water equity and infrastructure. We also have a new strategic pillar on economic transformation, which is looking at the intersection and really the opportunity to not only protect our environment and protect our fresh water, but also make sure that we are developing in a way that's sustainable, inclusive and resilient uh, for all of our communities. We also work on ecosystem and source water protection. Next slide, please. Okay, so lead service lines and other water equity challenges are heavily concentrated in the Great Lakes region. And to be sure, these challenges are national in scope, but in our view, 
Uh, solving them requires centering and prioritizing the Great Lakes region. You know, you can't solve these national challenges without solving them in the Great Lakes. And so in 2020, we decided to form a Mayor's Commission on Water Equity. And this uh, Mayor's Commission on Water Equity was meant to respond to these challenges and promote the equitable access to clean, safe, and affordable water for all residents of our basin, which unfortunately has not always been the case. I want to also say that we are hiring uh, currently a position to support this commission. So if anyone knows of any qualified candidates, please get in touch. Um, this commission focuses on a variety of priorities from lead service line replacement to urban flooding. And we are led by uh, Mayor Cavalier Johnson of Milwaukee and Mayor Sean Patterson Howard of Mount Vernon, New York. Next slide, please. So the Mayor's Commission on Water Equity leads our advocacy on all water equity issues. We regularly engage with our partners at EPA, the White House, and uh, at the state level with state revolving funds. We were proud, as you'll see pictured here, to be invited to participate in the White House Water Summit this past April, and also the launch of the Biden-Harris Get the Let Out Partnership in January of 2023 to continue to elevate the needs of Great Lakes communities in these critical discussions. Next slide, please. All right, so a new initiative I wanted to uh, talk about that we announced at the White House Water Summit this past April is the Great Lakes Lead Pipes Partnership. And I'm hoping we can talk a little bit more about this in the discussion. So this partnership in our view is necessary for several reasons. Uh, one, as I've already mentioned, lead service lines are heavily concentrated in the Great Lakes region. And as we'll hear today, Great Lakes big cities are starting to make tangible progress on expediting their lead service line programs and doing so in an equitable manner. And this really needs to be celebrated. Um, and also, uh, we make, need to make sure that uh, this progress is recognized and that we build upon this progress across the region. However, there are still a lot of common challenges that remain, whether we're talking about community outreach, workforce development, uh, securing the funding necessary to be able to actually uh, do full lead service line replacement and do so in a way that's on a faster timeline. And so this partnership is intended to uh, get mayors in the driver's seat, leading the way in advocating for more federal dollars, sharing best practices across the region, and overcoming common, common challenges to speed the pace of replacement. So we are really pleased to be working with Mayor Brandon Johnson of Chicago, Mayor Mike Duggan of Detroit, Mayor Cavalier Johnson of Milwaukee, along with the water departments participating in today's event to advance this important partnership. And we look forward to working with all of you to continue to expedite lead service line across the Great Lakes. With that, I will turn it uh, back over to Richard. Much appreciated, Travis. Uh, first, we are going to hear from the city of Detroit and uh, Mr. Brian Peckinpah of Detroit Water and Sewers District. Good morning. This is uh, Brian Peckinpah from the Detroit Water and Sewers Department. And I'm the Public Affairs Director. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, Travis, for having us to share our story about lead service line replacement in Detroit. Jasmine, can you share my slides? We'll just give you a brief overview of lead service line replacement program in the city of Detroit and how we've expanded contractor capacity and have accelerated our pace. We'll just wait for the full screen. There we go. Thank you. Next slide, please. So in Detroit, we started lead service line replacement in 2018. We included it in our capital funded construction. What that means is while we're replacing water mains and neighborhoods, we're also replacing the full lead service line from the meter inside the house in their basement all the way to the water main. And we were doing through that process about 700 lead service line replacements per year at that pace starting in 2018. There's been no direct cost to homeowners. Uh, we have um, provided the cost um, through our operations and through our grant funding, which you'll see in a moment. 
And our average annual rate, water rate increase since 2016 has been 2.9%, uh, lower than inflation per year uh, on average. And so we've been able to keep rate increases low while also doing this incredible work to get the lead out and address um, a public health and safety issue. Our inventory in the city of Detroit, we're a 140 square mile city, um, large geographic area. We have 80,000 lead service lines. We are mainly a single family housing area. We don't have a lot of um, multi-unit housing. Um, so 80,000 lead service lines is estimated. We have replaced since 2000, between 2018 and 2023, 5,884 service lines. And this year, as we accelerated our pace in Detroit, we were on the track to replace 8,000 in 2024, 8,000 lead service lines from a, a pace of about 700 a year. Now, we did request from the state of Michigan to extend the timeline to replace the lead service lines. Uh, we did that in 2019, made that request. However, we are on pace now to finish our lead service line replacement in the next 10 years, and we will exceed the state's requirement in Michigan, as well as the EPA new lead and copper rule improvement, or the LCRI. Um, and we have to do this while keeping safe, affordable water into account because 70% of our Detroit residents are at or below 200% of the federal property level, 30% um, of our residents are at the federal property level. Um, so we've increased the pace of service line replacements throughout our neighborhood. This is a picture of a Detroit neighborhood getting a service lines replaced. We sped up in May, 2023. And again, we expect to replace them all by 2035. Next slide, please. Now, how are we doing this without very little rate water rate impact? Uh, we've diversified our funding sources. We've been very fortunate. The Biden-Harris administration has been supportive of Detroit and many other cities, including our colleagues here on this webinar, um, to get funding from federal and state sources to replace lead service lines. We've received ARPA funding through the state of Michigan and EPA um, we've received uh, a pilot grant initially in 2018, as well as uh, the Competitive Wind Grant, which is a $5 million um, grant that we received that we're having small contractors replace lead service lines. And we have other ways that we've diversified our funding. We've also used capital dollars. In fact, our Board of Water Commissioners is voting on that item today to have three contractors split a $30 million uh, $30 million in capital bonds to continue our pace of lead service line replacement. Next slide, please. And how do we do this? It's great to have funding, and it's a credible opportunity to have this uh, historic funding uh, across America and here in Detroit, but we have to be able to do it with contractors. So we were challenged by Mayor Mike Duggan, the city of Detroit, to expand our contractor capacity and also have employee crews to see if we could drive down the cost per house uh, for a lead service line replacement. So in the past year, through our Diversity Opportunity and Inclusion Director's Office, Tiffany Jones, and uh, the rest of our leadership team, we've been able to expand contractor capacity we had two existing contractors that worked on water main and other projects uh, through our capital projects, but we've had five new contractors now work with the city of Detroit. And then we added two employee crews. So this drove the cost down from 13,000 per house on average to $9,300 per house. So significant, that means we can do more houses with available funding, uh, significant change. And what are we doing per week? So our contractors are replacing about 175 lines per week. Uh, that's the current pace. And then we're our employee crews, the two employee crews with equipment we purchased with federal funding uh, as uh, they are doing 10 lines per week. Next slide, please. And this is just a breakdown of, and of course the team will share the slides with you. This is a breakdown of the funding sources. 
uh, that I mentioned in that pie chart with the percentages. And so we have to diversify in order to have uh, expand and accelerate the pace and get the let out within the next 10 years and also be able to have that contractor capacity and not have an impact on water rates in the city of Detroit. So this is how we laid out our funding. And then I have one more slide for you to share. Last slide, please, Jasmine. And then we offer the opportunity for our contractors to pick based on their resources, the method that they're gonna use. We are hydro excavating every house on the block to determine service line material. Then the contractor comes back and does a replacement with homeowner or occupant permission. In Detroit, we allow the adult occupant, whether they're the homeowner or not, to give us permission to replace the lead service line um, at their home. So that has sped up the, the replacements and also it gives us 100% compliance. And since 2018, we've had no complaints or challenges regarding that opportunity to have the adult occupant give us permission to replace the line. So you can pull service with a mini excavator. We can use directional boring. Obviously, that machine is very costly. Some smaller contractors can't purchase that uh, machine right now. So we allow the mini excavator or what they call a basement buddy where you push in the line from the basement. And again, we've decreased the cost to 9,300 per line. So um, happy to answer any questions and look forward to a robust conversation as we move through this webinar and I'll take it back to Richard. Thank you. Much appreciated, Brian. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, next, we will hand it over to Mr. Michael Grillo with Chicago Department of Water. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Grillo. I am a deputy commissioner for the Chicago Department of Water Management. Uh, I've been with the city about 27 years. Uh, through the years, I've had uh, other responsibilities, but in my current role, I oversee our lead service line replacement programs, uh, as well as uh, we have our water meter division, new construction division, and plumbing inspections. I'm happy to be here today, and I just want to go over and talk a little bit about what we're doing here in Chicago. You can go to the next slide, please. So just a quick overview of Chicago's Department of Water Management and what we do, right? So um, high level responsibilities are uh, drinking water treatment, water distribution maintenance, uh, and how do, we, how do we do that, right? So our main focus is we provide safe, clean drinking water to nearly 3 million uh, Chicago residents in 120 surrounding suburbs. Um, and how do we do that? We do that with, we have about 2,000 employees in our department. Uh, it starts with our intake cribs. We have two intake cribs that we maintain. Uh, they're about two miles out in Lake Michigan. Uh, those two intake cribs draw fresh water into our two water treatment plants. Uh, we have the number one and the number eighth largest treatment plants in the world, conventional treatment plants. Uh, and those two treatment plants are able to treat and pump about 650 million gallons of water each day. Uh, we are responsible for providing about 41% of the state of Illinois' drinking water. Um, at that rate, 650 million gallons a day, we are only at about 30% of our rated capacity. So there's much more room to grow uh, to, to bring on downstreamers and provide that clean water that we, that we treat further down in, as far out as we can reach. Um, from those two treatment plants, water is pushed to 12 pumping stations scattered throughout the city. Uh, those 12 pumping stations then pump that water through over 4,300 miles of water main and eventually through about 500,000 service line connections. Uh, and we'll get into that in a few minutes. Of the 500 service line connections that we have, roughly 400,000 uh, are lead or suspected lead. Uh, next slide, please. So the previous slide shows what we do on the water side of things. We also maintain the sewer system as well. Responsibilities, high level, combined sewer system, sewer system maintenance. Uh, our sewer system covers both wastewater and stormwater. Uh, we cover 100% of the city of Chicago. So we're looking at about 230 square miles of drainage area. Uh, and there's just some things that we maintain as part of the sewer main. Uh, 4,600 miles of sewer main, 263,000 catch basins. Uh, there's 150,000 manhole structures, 184 
combined sewer overflows. So if you were to take our water main and sewer main and stretch it end to end, it would reach from Chicago to LA and back twice. Just a fun fact, if, if anyone's looking for a fun fact. Next slide, please. So uh, lead service line replacement notification act, uh, the state act kicked in for the state of Illinois in January, 2022. Uh, Chicago caught a little bit of a break. It kicked in January, 2023 for us. Uh, some of the things that go along with that act, uh, we maintain the lead service line inventory online. We, that's been up since 2021. Um, notifications of lead service lines to any building that has one obviously partial lead service line replacements are banned uh, lead or galvanized services must be replaced alongside any water main replacement uh, and i'll get into it in a second but we also replace those alongside any sewer main replacement as well um, and then just this past april we uh submitted our our long-term lead service line replacement plan uh which needs to be updated i believe every every april now until the final version is due uh, 2027. So that's just some of the things that, that are covered by that Replacement Notifi Notification Act. Uh, next slide, please. So just want to talk a little bit about the programs that we offer here in Chicago for lead service line replacements. Uh, we have five listed. I call it seven block level. Really, those are three separate programs and we kind of have those bunched together. So just to go down the list, homeowner initiated program was the first program that we put out. That was in 2021. Um, it was the quick, easy program to put out because number one, we were not doing the work and we weren't paying for it. So that program is basically a homeowner, hires a private contractor, pays for their own replacement. Uh, but what the city does is we waive up to $5,000 in permit fees to help with that. Uh, when we put that program together, we thought we would maybe get 100 to 150 people a year replacing their own service lines because let's face it, it's, it's pretty expensive to do that. Uh, but we have seen about 800 replaced so far by homeowners since 2021. That uh, I will also mention that that is the only program that we offer that comes at a cost to our residents. Everything else that we offer is completely free. Uh, the second program that we kicked out, uh, an important program, our equity lead service line replacement program. Uh, that is a free full lead service line replacement pro program offered to low income homeowners. Uh, there's an application process. It's mainly single family and two unit buildings, uh, owner occupied. Uh, we have a goal of 600 a year for that. Um, that started, really started in 2022. It started at the tail end of 21, uh, but really kicked into high gear in 2022. Um, the reason we, we picked 600 as a goal uh, it was because of the funding. That's what we were able to pay for with the funding we put towards that program. Uh, and so far, we've replaced over 1,500 service lines as part of the equity program. Uh, the next one that we rolled out was our daycare program. So that's a program uh, that targets state licensed daycares. Uh, again, a free full lead service line replacement. Uh, we prioritize low income neighborhoods to start. Uh, we're rolling that out neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, the goal that we had for that program was it was 100 to 120 a year. We're closing in our second year of that program. Um, and we've replaced about 185 services as part of the daycare program. Um, and then the, the next program is our leaks and breaks, which is by far right now our largest program. So that is if any lead service line is impacted by um, a break or a leak that was repaired, it could be a leak on the service itself. It could be a broken main that's repaired that may impact one, two, three, four different lead service lines. Uh, it's really any service line, lead service line that's impacted by any underground work, whether that's city work, other utilities, other companies. If it's damaged, we put them into the leaks and breaks program. Um, in Chicago, we see roughly 3,000 to 5,000 breaks a year. Um, so I don't really have a goal for what I expect to break. Uh, the goal is to maintain what's breaking. So. Uh, if we get a if we get a mild winter, there's only 2,500 breaks or leaks that are repaired. That's our goal. Our goal is to stay current. Um, luckily, last two years, knock on wood, uh, our winters here in Chicago have not been too bad. So we haven't seen that huge number of leaks and breaks pop up yet. Uh, but since we started that program, that kicked in in 2023. In 2023, we were maintaining that program with in-house construction crews. Uh, 2024, we were able to bring about three contractors on, three prime contractors 
broke the city into six groups um, and have gotten some some help by contractors. We've replaced about uh, 3,200 services since 2023 as part of our leaks and breaks program. So then we get to our block level programs. Um, really, it's three programs. So we have a program for lead service line replacements only. That would be think of uh, newer water main, newer sewer main. We go in and just replace the service lines because we won't be back to replace that water main, say, for 50 years. Um, we are going to kick off our first program for lead service line only replacements uh, in about a month. Uh, but we have been working with water main replacements, our, our CIP work, our capital improvement project. So any water main replacement, any sewer main replacement, uh, we replace any service line that falls within that project limit. Um, obviously it would make sense if, if you're looking at water main, you're gonna replace that water main, so you have to disconnect and reconnect to the new main, so you have to replace those services. Uh, but if the question is, why do we replace service lines alongside sewer main replacement? Um, if you could picture the sewer mains dead center of the street, the water main sits usually in the curb lane of one side or the other. So those service lines that cross over the sewer main have to be disturbed when we lay a new sewer main. So those get replaced. And because we're tearing up the whole street, if we're going to replace services on one side of the street, we're going to replace the services on the other side as well. So again, any service line that falls within the project limit um, is replaced, whether it's water main, whether that's sewer main. Um, so the graph on the, on the right kind of shows, like I said, leaks and breaks is our biggest program. So in the beginning stages, that would be the biggest number of replacements. And then as we replace those, or I should say repair and replace those leaks, those would, would die down over time. And then our block level would kick in and that would be the, uh, the large portion of replacements, um, homeowner initiated equity daycare. Those are voluntary programs. We reach out to the homeowners, but ultimately it's, it's up to them whether they want the service replaced or not. Um, leaks and breaks block level is initiated by us because the, either there's a disturbance to the lead service line or we're coming in with a, with a planned project. Um, and so we offer full free replacements, but it is not mandatory. Uh, we wish it would be because it would help with participation, but uh, right now it is not mandatory in Chicago. So uh, the owner still has the the option to decline the private side. So when that happens, we will replace the public side. So if there's a disturbance, if it's a planned project, for example, we're gonna replace a water main, we're gonna tear the whole street up. Um, if the owner declines the private side, we still replace the public side so we can pave that street, at least that part is, is completed. Uh, so that's that's what Chicago is doing as far as, this is just a, just a quick glance at the programs that we have. Um, and kind of how this is going to play out over time. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide is just to show some of the funding options that are available to us and what we use them for. Um, and it, it's intended to show that funding is not one size fits all, right? So some funding has restrictions. Some can be used on both the public side and the private side. Some funding can only be used on public side. Uh, and this is kind of um, what we use this funding for. So community development block grants, our CGB, CDBG funding, we get about 15 million a year so far. We use that to fund our equity uh, program. It can be used both on public and private. Uh, wind grants, we applied twice, haven't been awarded anything yet. Um, federal earmarks, we've gotten almost $2 million this year. Uh, and that can be used both on public and private sides. Uh, we executed a $336 million WIFI loan in uh, 2024. Um, we use that mainly for our public side replacements. Um, because we pay back that loan using rate revenues, we cannot use that on the private side. So that's our, that's our main bucket of funding, if you will, for public side funding. Uh, we did get in the first round of our daycare program uh, four million in principal forgiveness from the Illinois EPA. Again, that that's used on both public and private, right? So free money, grants, earmarks, principal forgiveness, uh, that can be used anywhere you need to use it. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately for Chicago, there's not a lot of free money available to us, which is why we have that large loan that we executed. Uh, we did receive fourteen million this year uh, from the Illinois EPA for our block level 
replacement programs in our highest scoring census tracts. So there was seven that we were awarded. It's $2 million in each tract, so we got $14 million for that. Those programs should be starting uh, early next year. And then at the bottom here just shows water revenue bonds, ge uh, general obligation bonds, um, and then TIF funding can be used on public side, but we're not using that funding yet. We're still reviewing that to see how, how that can work for us, what we can do to make that work. Uh, but yeah, this this graph is just to, just to show some of the funding that's available to us and how complicated it could be to get to, to work through all that. Uh, and, and we could talk about that later, but the uh, when you're trying to separate the funding for what's used on public and private, it really comes down to tracking that data correctly uh, and making sure that's all done properly. And so that was just a quick look at some of the things that we have going on in Chicago. Uh, and that's all I have for, the, for this presentation. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, thank you for that, that thorough explanation of uh, Chicago's lead service line replacement work. Uh, next, I'll turn it over to Mr. Patrick Pauly of uh, Milwaukee Waterworks. Pat? Thank you, Richard. Good morning, everyone. Pat Pauly, uh, Superintendent Milwaukee Waterworks. While we're waiting for my slides to come up, I just have to say that Chicago's challenge is one of the few things that makes me feel better about Milwaukee's challenges. Um, we have about 65,000 remaining active lead service lines to to deal with. And I, I'll just take a few minutes to um, give you a, a brief overview of what we're doing. Um, Jasmine, you can move to the next slide, please. So these slides were taken from, we're required to report semi-annually to our common council. I pulled these slides from that report. I have to warn you in advance that there's too many words and each slide has more, each successive slide has more words than the previous. So you've been warned. And I won't, um, I'll just talk about a little of the high points. Um, similar to what Detroit reported, our costs were around $11,000 when we began our replacement program in 2017. They have slowly, thankfully, come down to the point where they're around 8,600. Our bid prices this year have been right around 8,000 for contract costs for a service replacement. I think that's due to primarily contractor efficiencies, but also we've learned a lot through these past nearly eight years about the right scope of work, the right type of um, contractual requirements, the, the right bidding scheme re related to bid items. And so I don't know how much lower they can get but um, we're certainly in a far better place now than we were seven years ago. Um, thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, we were able to eliminate the cost share for one to four unit residential properties beginning this year. So previous to this year, um, residential properties paid a third of the private side cost, which was in the $1,600 to $1,800 range. It um, was adjusted annually. It was certainly a hurdle for all of our property owners, but similar to what De De Detroit reported related to um, some of the underserved neighborhoods, it, it it was going to be an even bigger hurdle as we expanded our program. So we were very thankful for the bill funding, very happy to remove the cost share for property owners. It has resulted in improvement in our rate of consents, maybe not quite as much as we had hoped, but but some improvement. And so I think as the word spreads about the program, that'll get better. Our 2024 budget was for 2,200 replacements. You can see the breakdown there. We will exceed the 2,200, likely around 2,400, maybe get to 2,500. We have a, a furious end to the construction season. We'll, we'll be replacing over 100 a week um, beginning in November. Uh, next slide, Jasmine. And so this is just a breakdown of what we've done year to year. I think similar to what Chicago reported, leaks and failures drove our program up until 2024. We had anticipated based on our historical averages around 400. It turned out there were far more than 400 on an annual basis. And we still, this year, about 550. The child cares, um, we monitor child care openings and 
the child care replacements have been free to the property owner since 2017. They never had a cost share. Um, we continue to replace about 100 a year. And so nearly replaced 900 in the last eight years. And and so they continue to open. We reach out to the property owner, tell them that they're required to have their ser service loan replaced if it's led and work with them to get that done. Um, we've also, we do some replacements with water main replacement projects. And then prior to paving reconstruction projects, we're in a situation, I think a lot of Midwest cities are where the failing water mains, which were put in the 1950s, have copper services attached to them. And the and the water mains that are standing up the best over time that were installed in the late 1800s, early 1900s, have the lead services. And quite honestly, they are still performing better than the, the pipes that were installed in the 1950s. So we don't we don't do a lot of replacements with water mains. Um, we do more with prior to paving. And then this year we began our equity prioritization program. So um, so we've replaced a little over 8,000 total. By the end of the year, we, we should be near 9,000. Um, next slide, please, Jasmine. More words. Um, we are almost entirely reliant on the bill funding. And I mentioned earlier that the presence of the bill funding has been just an incredible benefit for the city of Milwaukee because the utility is paying for the public side. The private side was one third property owner, two thirds city general fund. And so with the introduction of the bill funding for lead service line replacements, not only have we been able to remove the property owner cost share, we have been able to relieve the city cost share as well. And so we were, were very fortunate to receive an award of 30.1 million for state fiscal year 2024. That's going to be used to replace 3,000 replacements beginning early in 2023 through the end of this year. We've applied for 34.2 million for next year's program for the 3,500 replacements. We're hoping to see an award yet in October. Um, and then we'll move forward from there. But the, the bill funding has been a game changer. And I'm probably answering some of the questions that are going to be asked. But for us, it's been a game changer. Um, next slide. Last slide. And then I just wanted to go through uh, um, our program. So we we talked about leaks, failures, child cares um, with water mains prior to paving projects. The new program we introduced this year was the equity prioritization program. And that was a basically a prioritization of every census block group in the city using the area deprivation index, the incidence of elevated, elevated blood lead levels, and the density of LSLs within a, within that census block group. So we created a prioritization, we ordered it, and then we took the top we took the top twelve in 2024. We're likely to do the next 20 in 2025, and we will keep. Um, working down that prioritization list. we At this point, we anticipate that the base program will remain around 1,200 a year and our continued expansions will be in that equity prioritization program. We have, we added eight positions in the middle of this year. We now have approximately more than 20 positions that are either primarily or fully allocated to lead service line replacement. And our overall staff we're authorized for a little over 400 positions. We're not filled to that level. So fully 5% of our staff, we may need more, more positions in the coming years. Um, as I mentioned, we intend to expand by 1,300 replacements in 2025. That will be through the equity prioritization program. We did retain an owner's rep to administer that program because we did not have the capacity internally. Um, and then our intent is to continue to expand in 26 and 27 to get on that pace to have all service lines replaced by the end of 2037. That's all I have. Hopefully I kept us on time. Yes, we are doing well on time, Pat. Thank you for that. Uh, great presentation on Milwaukee's program. All right, uh, now we will start with our uh, moderated Q&A panel in which uh, I have prepared some questions to ask panelists, uh, followed by my questions. My co-host, Travis Wheeler of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative uh, will also have some questions. So first question, uh, 
in realms of comparing and contrasting from 2023 to 2024, what are the biggest differences from last year's construction season to this year's? Where are you? Where were you at this time last year compared to today? Uh, let's start with you, Mike. So comparing 23 uh, to 24, um, in terms of construction, you know, like I said, our, our 2021, 2022 were pilot years for us. We were just building our programs and replaced a few hundred service lines. Uh, and then that leaks and breaks kicked in in 23. We went from, say, five or 600 replacements to 3,000. Um, the biggest difference, you know, that was our, our first big year um, trying to figure our way through this process, right? Because obviously we don't have to figure it out, uh, but we're getting better at it every day. Um, one of the major differences in 24, at least in my opinion for us, is that um, the level of uh, effort that we put towards coordinating with other utilities. Uh, when, as your, prog you know, as your programs ramp up and the more replacements you're going to do, the more coordination is going to take, uh, especially like, like Pat said, it's, uh, not just like gas company, electric company, but also with um, other city departments. So our Department of Transportation covers the paving, right? Um, so that that was, we were chasing our tails in 23 as these leaks and breaks were popping up on paving projects. And either we had to get in there so they can finish or they were holding it up for us to get there. Uh, and in 2024, we've gotten so much better uh, at help trying to coordinate that, even within our own department, right? So we have a lot of different bureaus within this department. Um, and the repair is made on a lead service line. It goes into lead, a leaks and breaks program. Um, but there's so many other people involved with their own construction, trying to coordinate uh, that effort. And, you know, the, the angriest phone call you'll ever get is if someone waited two years to get their street paved and we showed up two weeks later with a street saw and cut a hole into it, um, that's not the call you want to get. Uh, so we're really, really working hard to make sure it's construction, right? So some slip through the cracks. Uh, we're doing the best that we can. Uh, but for us, I think that's the biggest, you know, the biggest thing. As far as the construction itself, um, it's status quo. We, I think last year, 23, we, we completed about 3,200 replacements. This year, we're going to be a few hundred more than that. Um, and then 25 is going to be the year we start to really bring it up. Uh, so that's that's where we are. Great. Thank you for that, Mike. Uh, Brian, let's go to you. What are the biggest differences between this year's construction season and last year's? And, and where were you at last year compared to today? That's a very good question, Richard. So uh, when we started in 2018 replacing lead service lines, we integrated the program into our operations. So we don't have a separate lead team. We integrated it in finance and public affairs and operations and engineering. So to make it more flexible and nimble. So once we receive the $90 million to the federal government in 2022 slash 2023, we were able to scale up what we were already doing by replacing 700 lead lines a year. We were able to start bidding out these larger projects uh, to replace 8,000 lead lines a year. And we were able to um, do a, about 20 meetings among contractors new and existing to tell them that we're advancing this work we're going to speed up. Uh, we're not going to wait for the new LCRI. We're going to get ahead of this and do the right thing and get um, uh, the lead service lines replaced with good copper pipes. And we're going to do so very de deliberately. We also, one of the things we do in Detroit to get 100% compliance is to make sure that we do extensive outreach. We spend about $43 a house on outreach before the contractor even gets to the street. We do on the block community meetings with residents. We um, do advanced door hangers. So once we had that already in place for the prior four years, we were able to scale that up to a larger uh, replacement program with the federal funds. And then now we want to continue that work. So we diversify by having uh, using some capital bond dollars to continue to do that pace of work. Um, and, and we also did this with internal staffing. So we didn't hire an engineering firm to manage the contractors that still be managed all by the internal staff. They're the project managers uh, assigning the work. And we again, integrated it. So 
when operations or engineering decides that we're going to go in this area because it's the most vulnerable, it's the oldest part of the city, has the most density of lead service lines and density of children and seniors in the homes. They also check that data with public affairs with the PR team and say, uh, what's the outreach look like in this area? Do we have an organized community? Can we do it quickly? How quickly can we do it? So it's a very deliberate process and we've just been able to fortunately scale it to 8,000 a year, 8,000 lines a year. Wow, it's pretty significant. <laughs> Thanks for that, Brian. Um, Pat, same question for you. What are the biggest differences from last year's construction season to this year? And uh, where were you at this time last year compared to today? I was giving this some thought as Brian was talking and we might have to consult with Detroit to understand how they went so quickly to 8,000 because that just seems like a huge jump for us. Uh, so when the bill funding got approved and quite honestly, my memory is failing me how many years that go that was, that was well over two years ago, we knew we had to expand the program. Um, then our mayor Johnson put forth a 20 year goal for all lead service line replacements. So that added more pressure on us to expand the program. Then the LCRI rule got proposed and that added even more. And I guess through, throughout that, that time period, we were working diligently to try to develop a prioritization program to try to develop a plan to expand the program. So last year at this time, we were just putting in place the owner's rep contract, the finalization of the prioritization, the, I think a plan to expand year after year. And also at the same time, to, to great stress to our staff, trying to meet our goal of 1200 replacements. This year, and we're, we're not good at celebrating our accomplishments. And so this has given me just a brief period of time to think this through. I mean, this year, we are going to meet the goal of 2200. We are going to exceed the goal of 2200. We have been ahead of pace throughout the entire year. It's been, and I'm impressed what Detroit did without an owner's rep. I would recommend, <laughs> I can't recommend. Our owner's rep has been of great benefit to us. Um, CDM Smith was brought on board. They have significant national experience. They provide an additional resource for us. Um, they've taken some of the load off of our internal staff. So it's somewhat night and day from this year to last year. Got it. Thank you for that, Pat. And a uh, shout out, my colleague Amaru Atasi, who I see is in the crowd with CDM Smith. Thanks for being here, Amaru. Um, I, you all have alluded to this in, in some capacity, but just for the record, how have the federal resources positively impacted your lead service line replacement program? Uh, Pat, let's start with you. Well, I I said it was a game changer, and it it really was for for our program beginning in 2017. It was always so very dependent on the available resources in this in the city budget and we went the city went through a very difficult time leading up to last year when they were provided the authority to implement a a, a, a sales tax which has greatly relieved some of the the budgetary pressures but quite honestly the city still wouldn't have been in a position to allocate resources to expand the program like we've been able to do and like we plan to do. The the bill funding changed the entire equation moving forward. And I mean, we're hopeful the bill funding lasts longer than anticipated. And certainly we have had many conversations about what we're gonna do when the bill funding is exhausted, but for the time being, it has just changed the equation. It has allowed us to do things that we we didn't think we were gonna be able to do. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Brian, let's go to you. For the record, how have the federal resources positively impacted your lead service line replacement program? Richard, it has allowed us to accelerate our pace to the 8,000 lead lines per year. What we did with the initial $75 million in um, federal funding, that actually, actually came through the American Rescue Plan Act through the state that was allocated by EPA. Uh, we took that money and broke it up. So we took $5 million of that $75 million and ran, did startup of our employee crews. So we got equipment for them. 
we got the directional boring machine, the basement buddy. We were able to train the crews and then staff up for that portion. And then we did another 25 million to one contractor to do uh, lead service lines. And they're actually, they're supposed to be a two year contract. They actually uh, just finished their wrapping up right now. So uh, they finished uh, eight months ahead. Um, and then we, we took the other 45 million and use that to uh, spread out among uh, four contractors. And so then we're, we give them certain areas to concentrate on. This allows us to concentrate on the most vulnerable areas and then scale, again, scale up, like I said earlier, uh, our lead service line replacement program. And it's definitely a, like, like uh, it's been said, a uh, game changer and it's changed the level of uh, the pace of the replacement and we couldn't have done it without it. But now, now the big question is like Patrick said, <laughs> you know, how do you continue that same pace and uh, also not have an impact on water rates in your community? That's what we're uh, debating about internally right now. Got it. Got it. Thank you, Brian and Mike. How have the federal resources positively impacted your lead service line replacement program in Chicago? So, you know, obviously, right, every dollar counts. Uh, getting, getting some of that money is helping us to, uh, to keep these smaller programs independent of, of the big picture so that we can help the people that need help the most, right? Uh, our equity program, our daycare program. Um, in Chicago, with, you know, 400,000 service lines that we need to replace, uh, we can't get our hands on enough money to help. We need to, we need to ramp up. We need to ramp up very quickly. Uh, and this isn't just going to be a 10 year program. This is going to be a multi decade program, at least 20 years. Right. So uh, getting getting the funding and, and maintaining that for a long period of time. Uh, but but getting the funding to, to really kick off, like I said, the first program that we really kicked out was our our equity program uh, to help low income uh, households, you know, single family and two unit buildings. Those are owner occupied. So it's it's not rental property, they live there. Um, daycare is the same thing. Most of the daycare programs that we, that we or daycare clients that we replace, those are in-home care. So again, the owner lives there, so it's not just helping their business, it's helping uh, their family, helping their home. Uh, but it's made a, a huge difference and, help, and helps us to uh, expand, to keep expanding. Thank you for that, Mike. Uh, next, let's talk a little bit about contracting. So all of your cities have a uh, small women minority business enterprise, disadvantaged business enterprise requirement within your procurement practices. With more work coming online for less service line replacement, are you seeing an increase in the DBE contractors partnering with primes or DBE contractors even becoming prime contractors? Uh, let's start with you, Pat. So I think we've been, to date, we've been pleasantly pleasantly surprised by the contractor community response. We were, for a while there, we were getting two or three bids. Uh, most recently, we had seven bidders. I would say to the, the question about the small business enterprise, we have seen, we have one small business enterprise prime bidder who bids on most projects. That That contractor has also partnered with more than one other prime contractors who don't that aren't plumbing firms. So a lot of our work has since the beginning of the, the program didn't end up in the hands of small plumbing firms. It ended up in the hands of our typical heavy construction underground contractors that replaced water mains and replaced mainline sewers. They don't a lot of them don't have plumbers on staff. So what they have taken to is subbing out the plumbing work to a small business enterprise. So there has been some of that probably not quite as much as we would like to see, but there has been some partnering of SBEs with primes to date. Got it. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Brian, let's go to you. You know, are, are you seeing an increase in Swimby contractors partnering with primes or even becoming prime contractors themselves for your program? We are. Um, we have also been very deliberate about it. Our director, Gary Brown, has um, appointed a new position called uh, the Director of Diversity, Opportunity, and Inclusion, and that's currently uh, Tiffany Jones, and she's been very strategic about 
uh, outreach to um, various contractors, especially minority and women-owned contractors, uh, to get them to be subs to introduce them, do matchmaking. Uh, we've held workshops to do matchmaking with between subs and primes, um, and then also help them get to be a prime contractor. We have one who is actually working on the wind grant, the EPA wind grant, $5 million, one of the four contractors on that project. And she was a, her firm was a prime, uh, excuse me, a sub of another contractor that was uh, being mentored by that larger contractor that's been a long-term DWSD contractor. And so that's been very effective to match make and have them learn from the primes and then find out what resources they need because sometimes it's admin resources, right? It's not, it's bonding is an important piece, but um, admin resources to even like submit invoices and do the proper process to, to uh, administer their contract and do the follow through. So we've been very deliberate about expanding it and we're, we're doing events to uh, introduce people to Detroit, introduce small contractors to Detroit. We are focusing on Detroit contractors, but we also reach out to other communities in other uh, states to expand our capacity. Wonderful. Uh, Mike, um, are, are you seeing an increase in Swimby contractors partnering with primes or even becoming prime contractors to secure a bid on lead service line replacement in your city? Yes, definitely. So all of our contracts go out with um, stated goals for, you know, MBE, WBE numbers. Uh, so just by just by default, the more contracts we put out, the more partnering we're going to see. Um, and we do meet with certain groups of contractors, let them know what's what's coming down the pipeline with work so they can so they can be ready for that. Um, you know, we get like Pat said, we get a lot of the, the, the big contractors. Right. So the primes are usually very large and they have to sub out the plumbing work. Um, you know, any plumbing contractor can run a new service, but the contracts that Chicago puts together are sort of, I'll say all inclusive as far as it includes outreach, it includes the construction, it includes the restoration. Uh, so there's a lot of different components there where they have opportunity to, to partner with bigger firms. Uh, maybe they're gonna do the outreach, uh, you know, for a certain contractor, or maybe they do hauling or maybe they do uh, concrete work. There's a there's a way there for there's so much work. There's enough for everyone to be a part of it, uh, and we are seeing that that partnership. And what we're trying to do is um, repackage contracts, make them make them smaller, and make it so that the, uh, the the smaller firms have a chance to to bid on those and become a prime uh, and build capacity. You get a few of those under their belt. Next thing you know, they can they can bid on the big contracts. Uh, so so we are seeing that. Um, and like I said, we, we meet with the contractors on, on a regular basis just to let them know what's coming. So they're ready. Um, but so far it's, it's been, it's been positive. Great. Wonderful. Uh, last question for me, and this is in regards to, to your workforce and your local workforce ecosystem. So all three cities have some form of a local hire ordinance that applies when public work departments uh, seek to procure services from private contractors. How do you foresee lead service line replacement encouraging contractors to support diversity, equity, and inclusion in the hiring of plumbers, operating engineers, and laborers from economically distressed zip codes within your city? Uh, let's start with you, Mike. So I think there's no better encouragement for a contractor than steady work, right? So in Chicago, like I said, let service line replacements are not going away for a long time. Uh, and as long as we can stay on top of that um, and, and include those goals, um, it will give the opportunity um, for those MB and WB contractors to be part of that. Um, we are trying to um, do as much as we can to increase that participation, uh, maybe raise that percentage a little bit. Um, and like I said, it just, just by by default, because there is so much work, you know, at some point we're going to have uh, so many contracts out there at the same time. Um, there's going to be opportunity um, for that to for that to continue and for that to grow, and th that's that's what we're that's what we're hoping for. So we're, we're we're hopeful that as this grows, everyone becomes a part of it. 
we package up these contracts into uh, smaller manageable contracts. We're, we're looking at scope of work, some, some things that we can change to, uh, to help the small firms be part of that. Got it. Thank you, Michael. Um, Brian, let's, let's go to you. How do you foresee lead service line replacement encouraging your contractor base to support diversity, equity, and inclusion goals in the hiring of plumbers, operating engineers, and laborers from economically distressed zip codes within your city? Yeah, the, that's a very good question. So our, our goal here with our lead service line replacement program and any of our capital projects is to um, provide opportunities for Detroiters, for um, minority residents, underserved residents, because if we're using dollars that's dedicated to Detroit or allocated to Detroit or even using our capital rate dollars, who should benefit more is the people who receive the service and essentially are, especially the capital dollars are paying through it through their water rates. Um, we believe that's a priority for us. And there is a mayor, mayoral executive, executive order uh, for a certain level of construction projects. Um, it's $5 million and above that have to have a 50%, 51% should be Detroiters hours worked on the project. Um, so we strive to work with our contractors to meet that executive order. Uh, there is a mechanism if they don't meet it, they pay into a training program as a penalty, so to speak. Uh, so that's a way for us to encourage it. But from a lead service line replacement program perspective, we want to uh, ensure that through our negotiation process, once they win the bid for the contract, we want to talk through and I encourage them to hire Detroiters, to hire uh, uh, minorities and women to work on these projects and to benefit from the resources and long-term uh, viability. Because as Mike said, this is a this is a long-term project. We're all looking at 10 years or at least 10 years uh, of construction work just on lead lines. Got it, got it. Thanks, Brian. Uh, same question for you, Pat. You know, how do you see lead service line replacement encouraging your contractor base to support the hiring of the, the skill sets needed from the economically distressed zip, zip codes within your city? So, as you noted, we've had a, a local hire preference program for many years, and we've included it on all our construction contracts. It's 40 percent of all hours worked by someone who's certified in the residence preference program. We've also had an apprenticeship requirement for many years that just applied to um, construction craft labor. We expanded the apprenticeship requirement this year to include operator and plumber, but it turns out we may not have codified the requirements well enough. And so we were fortunate enough to be named a workforce hub by the Biden administration earlier this year and we've been working with the EPA, the Federal Highway Administration, and the White House to, they brought best practices from other areas of the country. They brought some suggestions. We're fine tuning a more robust apprenticeship requirement, which would require a certain number of hours by discipline. And I think the number we've currently settled that is 10% of hours by discipline be worked by an apprentice and then a certain number of those hours be worked by an apprentice that was certified um, through a pre-apprenticeship program within the last two years. And that those requirements are going to be put in place to encourage slash require contractors from the local union community to seek out and find um, apprentices that are also part of the residence preference program. So we're we're gonna roll that out with our new equity prioritization contracts beginning in 2025, and are hopeful that will help create careers in this industry through the lead service line replacement program. Great, thank you for that uh, panelists. I'm now gonna hand it over to my colleague, Travis Wheeler to, to take us home with his questions. Thanks, Richard. So I want to pick up on uh, the equity conversation that we've been having. And uh, 
each of the cities, Chicago, Detroit, Milwaukee, have talked a little bit about how you've built equity into your lead service line uh, replacement programs, and you all have equity prioritization plans of some kind. So I want to ask you, what have you learned through the equity lens as you've established those prioritization plans? And what has been the impact on your overall lead service line replacement programs? And I'll start uh, by directing this to Mike. So with our equity programs, like for example, we have one of the first programs we put together was the equity replacement program, right? Geared towards low income uh, households. Um, even our daycare program is focusing on uh, low-income neighborhoods. What what we've seen, like I said, as far as uh, let's just say lessons learned, um, is the outreach really needs to be there. The, the message needs to be clear. Um, you need to gain the trust of the people you're trying to help. Um, so when we offer these replacements, we want them to say yes, um, but sometimes there's just not that trust. The trust is not there. Uh, and so we've, we've brought on some um, some some folks that specialize in outreach that's really helped our participation rates. Um, like I said, the equity and daycare programs that we run, those are voluntary. So it's not, they don't have to say yes. We reach, you know, we reach out to those people, but um, we want them to be part of this. We want to be able to help them. So uh, outreach is, is the biggest lessons learned, I think, when it comes to, uh, to certain areas of the, of the city that we're trying to help. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Patrick, how about for Milwaukee? What have you learned through the equity lens and what's been the biggest impact on the overall program? I think I mentioned earlier that we knew that for the equity program to be successful, we had to eliminate the cost share, the property owner cost share. And that's been um, one of the hurdles. The trust part is huge. And the, co the, the community outreach, the community outreach, the customer outreach, the outreach overall is so time consuming and challenging. And I think when we talk about replacing lead service isn't hard at all. It can be done in, our contractors can do it in half a day in nearly all instances. It's the coordination, the planning, the outreach, the consent, the education, all of that has, has been very challenging. Um, I, I would say that when we went through our prioritization program, I don't know that it quite landed on a, landed with us how much need there is in our disadvantaged community areas of the city. I mean, we we go through this prioritization and the, the ADI scoring system is one to 10. And there are so many census block groups, specifically on the near north side, that are tens, which 10 is not, it's not the good end of the scale to be on. And so when we started to do this prioritization, I think it, it drove home how important it is for us to focus on the equity prioritization program with our expansion plans in the future. And then when we start having conversations with the health department about elevated blood levels and child lead poisoning. And so I think it, it just reinforced that we were doing the right thing for the right reasons with the equity program. Thanks, Patrick. Appreciate that response. Uh, Brian, I know you all have equity prioritization built into your efforts as well. Um, what have you learned looking at things through this lens and what's been the impact on the overall program? Uh, Travis, we uh, here in Detroit, we we took uh, ArcGIS. So we used the ArcGIS platform to map out our lead service line locations. We worked with uh, Blue Conduit out of Ann Arbor to, to do the probable locations. But where that's helped with the equity part is that we can take the census income tracks, we can take uh, demographics from census as far as seniors and children in the homes and the age of the housing stock from our city permit data. And we merge all that to see where the priority areas, where's the most vulnerable areas of the city to start first. And where that helps us, that helps us with the equity piece, but that also helps us to communicate to the rest of the city, why are you here instead of in my neighborhood? Um, so it helps us communicate to uh, all residents, you know, and communication like and outreach, like Pat said, is very intensive on the front end. Why are you replacing the lead lines? My water is fine. 
uh, why do it now? Uh, why do you need to be my house? And that's why in Detroit, we all we allow the adult occupant to sign the agreement to uh, release that barrier because sometimes the landlords aren't local. Um, so we allow the adult occupant. And then um, the RH2 continues past the pipe replacement uh, because restoration is uh, probably like the other cities. People are concerned about their bushes and their porches. Uh, restoration is also a big factor in making sure that's done correctly and uh, communicated on the front end what they're going to see after the replacement is done. Great. Thank you so much for those responses. So uh, building on some of the discussion that happened earlier regarding the investments from the Biden administration uh, that have helped all of you accelerate your programs, and especially thinking about how that's helped you uh, accelerate it from an equity perspective and not passing all of those costs on to uh, homeowners and low-income residents. Want to talk a little bit about what your cities still need in terms of funding support. Um, you know, a concern I've heard from some um, utilities and also some residents is what happens when the infrastructure law funding goes away? How are we going to maintain uh, this pace of replacement? So, uh, Brian, I'm going to actually go back to you right away. Uh, from Detroit's perspective, um, what's still needed to support your efforts to remove every lead service line and continue to expedite, expedite replacement efforts? Well, Travis, the, um, with 80,000 lead service lines in Detroit, we estimate that's going to be close to a billion dollars to replace all those lines. And then you have to factor in the unknowns. Some of those unknowns that we all have in all three cities, uh, likely some of those are lead lines or galvanized that were required to replace galvanized as well. Um, so funding is definitely a need. So as we look at uh, the BIL changing and the ARPA funding going away, we're looking at how can we, um, over time, use capital dollars to continue the pace of lead service line without having a significant rate impact. We can't raise rates double digits that this unsustainable and it would create an affordability issue here in our city, um, yeah, even further affordability issue. So we have to uh, be there very deliberate about how we utilize a mix of funding, still trying to get grants and um, use uh, DWSD or Detroit Water dollars to continue the pace and also look at philanthropic dollars. We've had a couple uh, groups reach out to us that were interested in supporting lead line replacement because they see it as a public health issue, which it is. And so we're uh, in continued conversations about that's another way to diversify the funding sources going to a third party or external sources outside of government. Thanks, Brian. Sounds like your strategy is going to be a lot of uh, diversification and leveraging different resources, which I know a lot of cities are looking at as we get beyond this era of uh, bill and ARPA funding. Uh, Mike, over to you. What uh, support does the city of Chicago still need to continue to ramp up its lead service line replacement efforts? So I, I think the the common thread is it's, it's funding, right? So um, if you have enough money, you can you can do it, um, and that and you want to keep that steady pace, right? So we don't want to every year have to try to figure out you know, once we get to a certain point and get to that pace that we need to be at. Um, we want we need to have that steady flow of support, steady flow of funding. Um, the other thing too is that um, contractor, we need to we need to make sure that there's enough contractors out there as we're all sort of pulling from the same pool of contractors, even just within the state of Illinois, but even surrounding states, um, you know, those, we see a lot of the prime contractors are pulling from the same pool of subcontractors. Uh, so we need to get more contractors involved and get and get into this. But um, for us, like I said, Chicago is committed to, to replacing these lead service lines free of charge to the customer. So the biggest challenge that we have uh, really is the private side funding. We have more options for the public side, uh, but the private side is, is where, we're, where we're lacking. We're trying to get creative with, with that funding. Like I said, for some of these um, funding sources that can be used on both public and private side, uh, we are opting to only use it for the private side and then match that with, 
with other dollars for the public uh, to try to stretch that. Um, but I think the, I think from from all three of us, you'll hear the same thing. It's it's funding, right? We just we need the money. If we have the money, we can we can get the work done. Thanks, Mike. Well, Patrick, for Milwaukee, I, I assume it's going to be funding, but I'm going to give you the opportunity to say that. What support it, do you need? <laughs> it is going to be funding. Um, I think we're hopeful that we can get a third of the way done with the bill funding. About seven, I mean, similar to Detroit, $700 million remaining for the remaining 65,000 plus services. So we're hopeful we get a third of the way or a little past a third of the way with that funding. And then the conversation turns to if the bill funding's exhausted and there's no additional federal funding allocated, how do we how do we best move forward and balance costs? Because the Wisconsin Public Service Commission does allow the utility to fund 50%, right now, 50% of the private side in addition to the public side. So potentially those costs could be, the private side costs could be shared by the utility. That will in, obviously will impact water rates. And right now, as I mentioned, we've been very fortunate with the bill funding that the we got principal forgiveness for the full private side. We received a little bit principal forgiveness for the public side, but the remainder of the public side is going to land on the, the water rate payers. And so expanding that exposure to include half the private side is going, is going to have a significant impact on rates. So we are trying to work as diligently as we can to use whatever bill funding is made available to us. And then there's gonna to have to be a serious conversation as that day approaches about how to pivot. Thank you, Patrick, for that answer. We have a lot of work ahead of us uh, now that we have, of course, the lead and copper rule improvements uh, finalized to, to figure out this funding picture. So looking forward to working with all of you on that. All right, we have some questions from the audience that I wanna start getting to. Uh, all right, we'll have a question from Sophia uh, Johansson, uh, who has asked, uh, for all of the uh, panelists, how are you planning to protect families and communities from lead poisoning until the last lead service line is replaced? Uh, cities such as Denver have been distributing um, uh, filters that are certified to remove lead. Are any of your cities pursuing similar efforts? And I will start uh, with Brian. Yeah, Travis, that's a very good question from the attendee. Uh, we are distributing NSF 53 pitcher filters and a cartridge is sufficient for six months. Uh, we're distributing those anytime we disrupt a water main or see a lead service line, visually verify there's a lead service line. We have a water main break. We uh, change out a meter in a house where we see a lead service line or we're doing the replacement project. Uh, anytime there's any activity related to the service line, we provide a pitcher filter. We've been doing that since 2018. We chose the pitcher filter because many houses, different houses have different style faucets. So we decided not to do the different attachments that you have to have for a faucet filter. So we do do that. And then when we do specific lead service line replacement, we also make sure that as part of the first door hanger, after they receive the initial door information packet, they receive the pitcher filter and the cartridge on their porch or in their hands if they're at home home at the time. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna press on to the next question so we can get through as many of these questions as possible. Um, so a question I'll direct uh, to Milwaukee, uh, Patrick. How have you been working with landlords to address uh, access to lead service lines in houses or other buildings where they might not be present uh, to facilitate replacement? This has one, been one of our biggest challenges since the beginning of the program. And Detroit mentioned that they, they allow tenant consent. We have been working with our city attorney's office. Our biggest hurdle to tenant consent is apparently related to Wisconsin state law. So we are going to continue to pursue that, but we, our program is not optional, it's mandatory. So once you are entered into the program for any of the reasons we talked about earlier, the lead service line has to be replaced. We have had difficulty gaining consent from non-owner occupied properties, and we continue to pursue them. Ultimately, if the waterworks isn't successful, 
through multiple attempts, we refer to the Department of Neighborhood Services. The Department of Neighborhood Services in Milwaukee has a lot more leverage with property owners. They pursue until they gain consent. But this is one of the inefficiencies of the program, and it's one of the inefficiencies that we hoped would go away when we re eliminated the cost share. We thought that would make it far more appealing for everyone, including the non-owner occupied, and it hasn't necessarily yet turned out that way. But we we do pursue, typically when it gets in the hand of DNS, they get consent within a couple of months, but we've had some instances where it's gone years without gaining consent. Thanks, Patrick. I know that's been a challenge for a number of uh, communities. Um, have a question in the chat uh, for Mike um, regarding Chicago's lead service line replacement efforts. Uh, just want to have a little bit of a better understanding what drives the uh, high per, plate, per pipe replacement cost in Chicago. So if you could talk a little bit about some of those dynamics, um, I think that'd be helpful for the audience. So yeah, I was, <clears throat> I was listening to uh, my colleagues and, and listening to the, the price per replacement that they, that they see in their cities. Uh, it is much more than that in Illinois or in Chicago anyway. Um, I think I think one of the issues, like I said, we're looking at as these contracts, we've only been doing it for a few years, right? So we're still, uh, I would say, still learning as we're going as far as uh, what to include and what we can, what we can do in-house. I think one of the reasons we're seeing um, increased cost, for, you know, like for replacement per, per line um, is a lot of the unknowns. So if if we could eliminate the unknowns in a con in a contract that goes out for bid, I think that would that would really help us. So in other words, if we put a contract out for a certain area of the city, the contractor doesn't know exactly where they're going to be going. Uh, in some neighborhoods in Chicago, you can it, it could be sand, it could be clay, it could be slag. The ground itself it, it would vary so so much within just a certain area. So when you put a contract like that out, they're going to bid worst case scenario. Uh, so we're we're really trying to figure out ways to to repackage uh, these contracts and and give the contractor as much information as they need to try to lower that price and at the same time uh, get competition. Uh, when there's only a few big guys that 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 bid on this, um, there's there's really no competition. So that's that's what that's what we're seeing. Thanks, Mike. So it sounds like there are some efforts underway to try to bring uh, those per pipe replacement costs down over time as you ramp up, yep. uh, which is great to hear. Um, all right, I wanna pose this question to all of the panelists. Um, has anyone reached out to the United Association of Plumbers and Steamfitters for an additional list of small and minority contractors in their area? And Brian, I'll start with you. Travis, we, we in Detroit have reached out to our local and regional plumber unions um and we are collaborating with them one of one of the things with our lead service line replacement program is that we do need a plumber on the end where it's the making the connection to the house plumbing but as far as installing the actual line we generally use laborers that helps with the driving the cost down per house so usually what a crew only needs uh one plumber per crew and then or per uh, contractor because there may be several crews on the same street doing the work and then they could spread that plumber out to go and do the connections once the uh, new copper line is installed. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Mike, any outreach to the plumbers and standards on small minority contractors? In here? So um, similar to what Brian mentioned, we, we talk with our local uh, unions, uh, local or regional unions to to um, just to let them know what's coming, right? So that was what I was trying to get at is that they know there's a, a ton of work coming down the pipeline. Um, and we meet with certain contractor associations and certain groups of uh, smaller minority contractors. Uh, like I said, it really it really matters that uh, there may be more contractors out there. Like we, we sometimes see, we put something out for bid, maybe 15 contractors take the bid but only five actually submit something, right? So then after the fact, we go to those contractors and ask them why. Like, what, you know, what, what did we get wrong? What, what could we have done different so that you would have, um, you know, bid on that job? 
and we're taking that information to help us change future contracts. Uh, but we do we do meet with local and regional unions uh, and contractor associations to see who's out there, who's available. Again, get the word out so they all know there's there's work here to, to bid on. So uh, you know, come to Chicago. <laughs> I, uh, I cannot endorse that as a city's initiative employee because we represent many cities, but I live in Chicago and love it here. So <laughs> endorse that from a personal perspective. Um, over to uh, Patrick from Milwaukee, any outreach to the plumbers and steam fitters? On, um, not nationally, but certainly locally. Prior to being a workforce hub, we had sporadic conversations with them and our local contractors. Um, during this workforce hub, we've had many conversations with them. I think... One of the things that we hear is a challenge is that the city of Milwaukee maintains its own SBE certification process. The county of Milwaukee has their own SBE certification process, and then the state has a SWIMB certification process. So I think that's a hurdle for, and I, my understanding is that the city's process is rather cumbersome to navigate. And so I think there's been conversations about trying to combine or streamline that process, but I don't, to make it simpler and make the list larger and um, but i don't know how how quickly that's going to happen got it well another um i think we have time for maybe one more question and another good one just popped up in the chat that i want to pose to all the panelists um with the increase extreme storms and sewer backups throughout the region um this questioner is wondering whether or not we can coordinate lead service line replacement efforts with flood mitigation house by house. Uh, Patrick, let's go to you first to uh, talk about that coordination possibility. So we've done some coordination with, so Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District is, oversees the sewer, the, the sewer collection system, and they have a program to um, assist homeowners with re a replacement of sanitary sewer laterals. We have coordinated with them to replace the lead service line at the same time as the sanitary lateral is being done. That's been on a, a very small scale. I know they're interested in potentially expanding that. We run into trouble with the requirements of our ordinance related to selecting contractors and then having a contractor perform the sewer replacement work at the same time. So we've done some of that, not a lot of it. Uh, Mike, Chicago, have you uh, attempted any efforts to coordinate those lead service line replacements with flood mitigation? So, as I mentioned earlier, with all of our um, sewer line replacements, our, our sewer main replacements, um, we also replace all lead service lines that fall within that, um, uh, that job's uh, location. So, we are trying to coordinate a lot of the, any of the new projects that we are designing uh, that is sewer related is now including lead service on replacements alongside that sewer main replacement. Uh, it just for it just makes sense that we're going to be in the street. Sewer is usually dead center, the deepest surface structure, so the whole street's going to be ripped up anyway. Uh, like I said, half of those service lines are impacted anyway, so they have to be replaced as part of leaks and breaks. Uh, but all of our sewer main projects now include lead service line replacements if they fall within that project limit. Thanks, Brian. And any uh, efforts to coordinate there? Yeah, I have a two-part answer for that. So first, most of our, 80% of our houses, the sewer line goes in the back of the house into the alley. So our lead service lines, our water service lines are in the front. So we're mainly doing those separate from sewer projects. However, when we have a neighborhood-wide project, such as a stormwater project in one of our neighborhoods where we're doing sewer water main and uh, we combine it with lead. We're doing a detention basin in a, one of our neighborhoods where, where we have most, both the alley and the street dug up, just like Mike said, the street dug up. Um, we are doing lead lines in those cases uh, when it's a combined project. Got it. Well, thank you uh, for those answers. And I, I want to thank uh, the panelists for uh, their time, spending an hour and a half of their very busy schedules. Uh, talking about lead service line replacement efforts in their cities. Uh, I also want to thank the audience for some really robust uh, questions that led to some good discussion. And on behalf of uh, the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative and Blue Green Alliance, want to thank everyone and looking forward to 
continuing to work with everybody to continue to move lead service line replacement forward in the Great Lakes and address uh, these water equity challenges for our residents. So thank you everybody for uh, being here today and for participating in the webinar and we will be in touch uh, soon. Thank you.